Do you really know what gaslighting means? There's a lot of people on TikTok and Instagram and various other places talking about gaslighting, but I'm really going to go deep and explain to you exactly what it means. Hi, my name is Michelle Paradise. Welcome. As always, I'm going to unpack topics and today it's um, unpacking a topic around narcissism and narcissistic relationships about gaslighting. So I hope you'll sit back and relax and join me for this very interesting journey we have ahead. Now I'm going to use a film called Gaslight to explain exactly what gaslighting is because a lot of you won't know this, but in the 1930s uh, there was a British playwright that wrote a play called Gaslight and it turned into a film in the 1940s starring Charles Boyer and Ingrid Bergman, who probably mean nothing to you. Um, however, she went on to win an Oscar for the film, so it is quite interesting and very, very well done. And I watched it the other night. I hadn't seen it for quite a while. I haven't, wasn't around in the 40s, just wanting to let you know that. Um, and I watched it again, and it was a classic study of narcissism of a narcissistic relationship. So I thought it would be fun if I talked about the film and then I brought um, some, a glossary of terms around narcissistic relationships into it to illustrate what that can look like. So picture this beautiful young couple. Well, he's a bit older than her, but a beautiful young couple. And she's um, had a tragic experience, a very traumatic experience. And it was interesting to hear the word trauma used in the 1940s. This film was way ahead of its time in so many ways. So she is, she leaves London. She leaves the flat where her aunt was murdered and she goes to Italy, lucky woman. And she's wants to study to be a singer. And this man is her pianist and she's under the tutelage of somebody else. But so he's the pianist, she's the singer and she has a teacher that is training her in singing. Very nice, pleasant situation. What we then find out is the pianist, Charles Bouillet, is in love with Ingrid Bergman, the budding singer. And they're having this sort of clandestine secret relationship. Uh, the teacher doesn't know, but the teacher realizes that she's really deeply in love with someone. Now, this is the love bombing phase. And it is so clear in the film. They've known each other for two weeks, uh, but she adores him and he really adores her. And it's, you know, all the words and the actions and I can't live without you. So she, um, he approaches her to marry him in two weeks, which is a, is a real narcissistic move in relationship. They go very fast and they go very hard and heavy and they really, sweep you off your feet. So he asked her to marry him and she needs to think about it. So she decides to go away for a week to Lake Como. Beautiful. And in Lake Como, she's going to have distance and clarity and all of those things. As she gets off the train, there he is. He has arrived before her. We don't ask how. And he's like, I can't be a moment without you. Another very narcissistic move. Um, you just are the center of their universe. And while I'm talking about this film, the whole reason for me to do this is I want you to really think about the relationship that you're in, or maybe some hopefully past relationships you've been in and see the pattern of this so that you're aware next time or even this time and can do something about it. So there they are. They, they profess their undying love for you. Next scene, it cuts to the wedding, the, the honeymoon bed, let's say they, they got married. It's the next morning. She looks beautiful. They're in Lake Como. She is so in love and he is so in love. And you just think, wow, what a great relationship. No, the love bombing phase ends quite quickly for her. We're talking about probably a month, which is not unusual. A love bombing phase can last from a month to a year. And it, then there can be intermittent reinforcement in it where they love bomb you and then they kind of start devaluing you and they realize they're losing you, which also happened in this film. I'll get to that and come back to um, love bombing you again. But rarely 
with the intensity that they love bomb you the first time. So I'll fast forward through a lot of this. He convinces her to move back to London, to move back into the flat where her aunt was murdered. The case is still open. No one knows. The police do not know why her aunt was murdered, strangled. And um, she, the lead actress, really struggles to be in this in this flat, in this house. Actually, it was a house. Um, so she struggles to be in this house. There's everywhere she looks, there's all this sort of memorabilia. And um, there's one glove of a set of gloves, which might be relevant later. And it's signed by somebody who's one of her big admirers. And she also finds a letter from a very unusual name. I don't even remember it. Uh, professing his admiration and undying love for her. So all this is going on in the background. Anyway, lead actress um, and, and lead actor decide to take all of her aunt's stuff and move it up into the attic and board it up so she'll never have to look after it ever again. So you're still thinking, what a great man. He's doing all this for her. But no, he has a plan. And it's a very manipulative plan. And we don't know what the plan is yet. So he then spends the better part of the film gaslighting her, devaluing her. And I'm, I'm going to go through what this looks like. So what he does is he, for example, gives her a cameo, a beautiful brooch, gives her this cameo, and she puts it in her bag. And when she's not looking, he takes it out and hides it and then accuses of her her of being um, forgetful and losing things. And at first she doesn't agree with this. And then she, after many reinforcements of this, he does it with paintings and various other things, moves them around. He begins to gaslight her, which means robbing her of her reality, being very confused about the truth, whether she did say this, whether she did lose that, and that's what gaslighting really looks like, because what it is, which a lot of people don't realize, it is reinforced repeatedly. It's, it's not just a throwaway comment where the person thinks, did I say that? Didn't I say that? This, they drill down. They really drill down. And you get to the point where you think you're losing your mind, which is exactly what happened in this film. Now, why is it called gaslight or gaslighting? Because the period of the film, there were no electric lights there were gaslights. And what he did, it's a long story, I, I will just cut to the chase. When he was out of the room that she was in and he turned a gaslight on somewhere else on purpose and turned it up, hers would dim. And she was always mostly on her own because what he did was he isolated her, which is a big move with with a narcissist, and I will talk about that one for a moment, the isolation, the control, she saw no one, no friends, no family. She hardly even saw the servants that they had. He dealt with everything, and he made that very clear. So he was isolating her in this gaslighting. And she would say to him, the lights, when she saw him next, the lights went down five minutes ago. No, they didn't. And again, he just reinforced this. And he he chipped away at her sanity. And this happens in narcissistic relationships all the time, maybe not with gaslights, but interesting how this term came about. She then, um, she has a, a, a cook and a maid. And what he does is another term in narcissistic relationship is triangulation. So that's when there's three people. Now, these people could be dead or alive. You know, you could say to the person, the narcissist could say to the non-narcissist, um, when, uh, when you made that decision, your father would have been so disappointed in you. So father is dead or aunt is dead, but they're bringing them into the relationship as if they are still alive. So what he did is he triangulated her with the staff and he would, um, do something else called flying monkeys is when you convince those other people in the triangle that the non-narcissist is mad. They then spread the word flying monkeys. It's a, it's a reference to another film 
the Wizard of Oz when the monkeys did the dirty work for the Wicked Witch. So what he's done, he's triangulated her with the staff. He's pitted her against them. She doesn't trust them. She thinks they're talking about her, which they are, of course. And her value and her self-worth shrinks even more and more. Now, this is a very dramatic example of it, but I think a dramatic example is very helpful in this because it really illustrates what it can look like. And this film was so ahead of its time. So you've got triangulation, you've got gaslighting, you've got flying monkeys. Then there's breadcrumbing, um, which takes place within and not within a narcissistic relationship. But I'm going to specifically talk about the narcissistic relationship here, which they just give you a little bit of their time, energy, love. That's when they make reinforce, intermittent reinforcement. Um, I call it breadcrumbing. And that's when they come back a little bit. They never come back fully. They might love bomb you a little bit. They might go, oh, yes, darling, I know you miss your friends and family. Let's go to the theater, which is what he did. And, of course, she got all excited, wanted to reconnect to the world. And when the time came for them to go, he found something else wrong with her and gaslit her. And she collapsed within that. So she was really beginning to have a nervous breakdown. Um, he didn't so much ghost her, and ghosting means when you just completely cut off. I mean, I guess you could say there was levels of ghosting. So what he did every night, he would um, pretty much lock her in her room on her own. Um, remember, the staff and her have no relationship. She has nobody else. There weren't telephones to call people and things like that. And uh, she, he left, and he said he was going to work. And I'll get back to that in a minute where he went, because that's very interesting. So he just left her. He he basically ghosted her for 12 hours and she couldn't contact him. He had nothing to say to her. He wouldn't even tell her where his office was that he was going to work because he was a composer. So there was a lot of coercive control in this relationship. She had no access to anything. She had no access to her finances. She was a very wealthy woman. She had no access to her friends and family. She had no access to the outside world. He coercively controlled everything about her to the point where she thought she was losing her mind. And of course she was. She was absolutely losing her mind. He brought minimization into it, which is another move that narcissists make. And these are all in the devaluation stage. So remember, it's love bombing, devaluation, discard. So there was a big part of this film which was about devaluation. So he minimized anything that was wrong with her. Whenever she said she didn't feel well or this or that, he minimized it. He was always worse than her. The rest of the world was worse than her. So she lost, absolutely lost, her self-worth, her self-belief. Um, he mirrored her. He would pick up a lot of her cues, which is another thing they do. He would listen to her words and repeat them back to her so they felt familiar. And um, he did another thing which is referred to as stonewalling, which is the silent treatment. He would, he would become as if he was the parent and she was the child, and he would be very dismissive of her, very authoritative. And where is the picture? The picture that was on the wall is missing. The space is still there, but the picture is gone. Where is it? I know you've got it. And of course, she would stumble upon it and find it because it was it was wide open there sitting for her to see and then think, did I put it here? Did I do that? And then he would scold her and then he would not speak to her. So in all of this space, he was really destabilizing her. Now, where did he go? He went to a vacant building. So they lived in number nine. And there was a vacant building, number five, and he would go through the back door and he would access the roof. He would crawl across the roof. He would then go into their attic, which remember was boarded up and all of her aunt's worldly possessions were there. And what was he doing? He was looking for her jewels because he knew that she had these very valuable jewels and he couldn't find them. So every night he would go there. Now what this did 
To the non-narcissist, she was lying in her bed, in the bedroom, hearing footsteps. There was not meant to be anybody there. She was seeing the gas lights dim and go up again. He would come back the next day. She would say what happened. I've heard footsteps. I heard movement. I heard crashing. The lights went up and down. And he said, don't be ridiculous. There's nobody up there. So she was now really convinced that she was losing her mind. And he was talking about having her committed to an asylum. And something very fortuitous happened. They did go one night to an event that he completely destroyed her and within the event and she broke down in tears. Won't go into that story. Watch the film. And um, this man saw her and recognized who she was because he was the he was the person that was still on the case, the detective that was on the case of her aunt's murder, still unsolved. And he saw the two of them, he saw how they interacted, and he then got involved from, from a detective's perspective, and he started following the man. And he realized what was going on, and he then went to the woman, and he told the woman that, um, well, she said to him, you know, I can't speak to you. My husband won't let me speak to you. She was terrified of him because this is how coercively controlling this guy was. So she went from this beautiful, young, lighthearted, loving life woman to this, I can't talk to anybody. Don't touch anything. My husband will kill me. And he probably would have if this guy hadn't intervened. So this guy intervenes. He then hears of her situation. She starts trusting him, realizing who he is, and says the lights keep going up and down, their footsteps. So he stays with her on one of the nights that he stays in the room and he hears the footsteps. He watches the lights go up and down. And he said, you're not going mad. The gaslight is really going up and down. And that's because he's in another room or upstairs turning the lights on, which takes the gas from your room and the lights are actually dimming. So she's like, wow, I'm not going mad. Isn't this great? And he said, no, you're not going mad. He said, well, your husband is up to something and we're going to find out what it was. Cut to the attic. Husband finds this beautiful ornate dress with all these jewels, which look like costume jewelry down the front, but they're not because the aunt thought it was a really clever idea to hide them in plain sight. And he, knowing about jewels, he starts to pull them off and he looks at them with his eyepiece and realizes that these are the real thing. So he's now got them in his pocket. He's coming back to kill her, really, um, and get away with the jewels and go back to the country of his origin. However, the detective puts two and two together and realizes that he is the man who wrote the letter with the unusual name. And he also knows that that man who wrote the letter was the last person to see the aunt before she was killed. And he has motive and he gets it out of him. And of course, the narcissist being the narcissist, grandiose, delusional, charismatic, denies everything and tries to convince this police officer, this detective, of his innocence. And for some people, it would be very convincing, but not for this detective, because he knew the truth. Now, it never really got to the discard phase. I guess you could say he discarded her along the way, because you can discard somebody and still live with them. So, um, but, but the justice of the end of the film is that she discarded him. And I'm not going to tell you too much about that because hopefully you'll watch the film and you'll see for yourself. But there is justice and there is, you know, I don't I don't believe in revenge with with a narcissist being in my own narcissistic relationships and being married to one. Um, I realized and this is a great takeaway I'd like to leave with you that revenge never works. You will expend so much energy trying, and I mean trying to revenge them, that you will they will never get it. It's as if you've got a blue brain and they've got a red brain and you're trying to get them to realize something that they can never realize. 
because they remember they've done nothing wrong. So what I learned in my narcissistic relationships was never to revenge. Don't bother. It's not worth it. It's not worth the energy. What you want to do is you want to seat metaphorically in the front row when it goes down because karma will come. Karma's a bitch and it will come. And just make sure you're there metaphorically with your popcorn or your glass of wine watching as it goes down and doing absolutely nothing. Your hands are clean and that's what you want. And that gives you all that energy that you did not expend on revenging them. You now have for yourself and your future life. So the film is called Gaslight. It's black and white, very moody, fantastic act, acting, won two Oscars for the film. Highly recommend it. But that's where the term gaslighting comes from. And in the 90s, it was integrated into a psychological term, became a psychological term. But this film is a, absolutely a case study in what, a dramatic case study in what a narcissistic relationship looks like. So if you think you're in one, run. Do not walk away from it. Whatever it costs you, get out of it because it is the most destructive relationship you will ever be in in your life and hopefully you will only be in it once. Thank you for watching and listening. It's always a pleasure. Stay safe, stay alert, be aware of your surroundings, of the relationships that you're in, and I look forward to seeing you on my next video. Please hit the subscribe button, and I'm also adding a link to my 30-day awareness journal. It's all about awareness of self, of relationships that we're in. It would be the perfect thing for you to do. The link is below, so please sign up for it get started, pay attention to the world that you're in because I couldn't see it for the longest time. And I did the work. I was in the work I do now. So even people like me can be hoodwinked into these types of relationships and not see the truth. Take care. See you soon. Bye-bye.